All right. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's Tipples, Brews, and Wines virtual wine tasting with Elizabeth and Jeff Beaudre, the owners of Tipples, Brews, and Wines. Thank you for joining us. Uh, this week, we will be enjoying the Bodegas Alto Moncayo Veraton Garnacha. It's a mouthful. And so is the wine. All right. So this is from Campo de Borja in the northeastern area of Spain. We will go through that area and uh, I hopefully have a lot of fun as we learn about why this delicious wine is so, so fantastic. So if you have not already done so, please go ahead and pour yourselves a glass. I'm going to pour ours. What are you going to say? Why this just delicious wine is so delicious? You had to think of another word for it. I, I don't know at this point. I, it sounded like that. Did it? So I was like, yeah, I could see that you've already used that adjective. So. Well, I think, no, it meant more like it's, it's unique in a really, um, a really. Delicious uh, way? No, no, it's, 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 uh, it's a unique expression because it's from a very small, distinct area of the world. Okay. So uh, let's uh, pull up the first slide, if you All would, right. please. And we'll get into discussion of, um, so I give this guy a quick 30 minute chill to just take it down to about 55 degrees. Um, I like my red wines to start at uh, what would be European cellar temperatures, which is approximately 55. And then warm up, I mean, this is Florida. It's gonna be, <laughs> it's, it's going to be in the seventies by the time we get done drinking it. But I'll give it a nice little swirl to get started. Um, ratings on this guy, um, Bodegas Alto Moncayo, is a garnacha specialist. This is all they make. Okay. Uh, they uh, they have three different levels. This one is their entry level, which is in no way entry level okay. garnacha. Uh, <laughs> so uh, it's, they they only make high end garnacha. Uh, the ratings in this guy show it um, 92, 91, 91. Other vintages 92, 93. It it always clusters above 90. For this guy, everything I've seen. Okay. It's a, um, Garnacha is a really flexible red wine. Uh, and that's one of the great things about it. So it's um, smoked meats, uh, especially like for smoked, you can go like a smoked poultry mm -hmm. or you know, like a smoked duck would be amazing with it. But also can go with pork, sausage, and um, like a, a leaner but spicy beef dish, like a beef stir fry kind of mm -hmm. thing would work really well with this as well, also. All right, so. Let's uh, jump back to us. We'll take our initial thoughts on this and then we'll delve into why we're tasting what we're tasting. All right. Mm. This is 100% Garnacha. Uh, the exact same grape as Grenache. Okay. Different name, same grape. Alcohol content is beefy on this guy, 15 and a half percent. Oh, wow. So, yeah. So if you haven't eaten yet, that's right. <laughs> you may need you to may balance need to be out a little, a little careful. Bit. <laughs> so let's uh, mm, really nice. Some uh, combination of red and, and black fruits on there. You know, uh, I've got red cherry. I've got black cherry. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it gets a little darker on there. Some nice spiciness that is indicative. That's normal for the grape. Okay. Hmm. 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 So beautifully dry, beautifully spicy, mm -hmm. really nice amount of tannin, but not aggressively. It's not an aggressive tannin, but it's got really nice structure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can definitely feel it. Mm -hmm. You and can feel not, the pucker, yeah. but it's not overwhelming. And it's not making you think, oh, I need to grab for a piece of cheese or meat no. to try and recover my palate. No, here. that's a good description. I can feel the pucker, but mm -hmm. it's not a bite. But I can definitely, I can feel the pucker from the tannins. And though um, with this Garnacha, I'm getting a little bit of a, um, a baker's chocolate effect in here. Mm -hmm. It will be more obvious as the wine opens. Okay. So this wine will evolve as we're drinking it. It's a, it's a really, uh, it's wound up a little bit, which is good. It's even because of um, it's where it's grown and mm -hmm. how it's grown, which we'll talk about more but we will get more from this as we're drinking. So I would expect mm. it to be able to age because of the alcohol, it's wound up, 
in tannins, but can it age? Good question. That's the next one on the list. Oh, okay. All, right. All right. Very nice. <laughs> Were you looking at my notes? No, I wasn't. So. I, try, I really try not to at all. So. <laughs> so this is a modest ager. Okay. Um, which is in, it's normal for garnacha or grenache, right? So it has higher alcohol, mm -hmm. which is check, right? For aging capability. Mm -hmm. uh, the next one would be high tannin. No, medium tannin. Right. The other thing that helps with age of worthiness is high acidity. No, medium acidity. Okay. So because of those other factors, it pulls back to where it's a medium aging wine. So five to 10 years really don't look for more than 10 years on this wine. Okay. Mm -hmm. so Even though it's great. Medium know. is five to 10. Sure. What's long? Long. So long, you, I would go, long would be 20 plus. Okay. You know, and then a kind of a standard age worthy, mm -hmm. I would say 10 to 20, right? Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. So there are certain wines, I mean, there's certain Italian wines, for example, where you don't want to look at them before 15 years. Oh, wow. I mean, I've, I've had one, I've had a Barolo that I opened up after 10 years and we thought, nope, <laughs> this needed more time. So it, it, it can depend on the one. That's a long and that one can go 30 years. So if you have like people that have inherited mm -hmm. wines, okay, mm -hmm. so you've got like a... Because you're saying, okay, 20 plus is a long time. It is a long time. Yeah. You inherit a bottle that's 80 years old. Right. You is it always bad? It is most likely. Okay. <laughs> not as good as it could have been at 20 or 30 years. Okay. Right. No matter what it is. So. so if you get a bottle that you've been told can age. Right. And you notice, okay, we're, we're hitting the 20 whatever mark. You should probably do some research. You should, yes, you should do some research because okay. it's most likely time to pop that guy open mm -hmm. to get the best out of it. Okay. Um, nothing worse than you look at something and you have regrets where you say, wow, I should have opened this five years ago. Sure. I missed the peak on this beautiful wine. Yeah. Kind of a thing. So. Um, you said you wanted me to share? Um, not yet. Okay. So um, dryness, uh, this, this wine. So it's definitely a dry wine, mm -hmm. right? It's got some nice fruit on it, but this is a dry wine. It, it is not sweet, but it does have a fruitiness to it. And there is a difference, and that's an important difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've talked about before, in case like you missed weeks that we've talked about it, mm -hmm. that a lot of times if you're a new wine drinker, mm -hmm. you might equate, your brain just equates mm -hmm. fruitiness with sweetness. Right. Even though it's not a sweet wine, and it's not like you're doing it on purpose. It's that your palate right. is used to saying fruit equals sweet. Right. Yeah. It, it's a, you know, it's a standard and very reasonable thing for your brain to mm -hmm. equate. Oh, that's fruity. That's sweet. Right. So it's actually something that you have to train out as yeah. you're tasting more and more wines. Right. Just because I taste fruit doesn't mean it's sweet. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, the really the, the true designation on that. I mean, the effective designation for what's dry and what is off dry or, mm -hmm. you know, or sweet is what's happening on your palate. Right. But technically, it comes down to the amount of residual sugar that could be measured in the wine. Okay. So. Okay. So but if you want to go really empirical with it. Then right. If you want to go empirical with that one, okay. you can. Okay. And there are so many things in wine drinking that are not empirical. Right. right. right? Yeah. But the dryness of a wine is an empirical. It's, okay. Um, it's quantitative. Yep. Mm -hmm. Which is, I think, kind of nice. Mm -hmm. um, acidity on this guy is medium. So once again... You could designate that with pH levels. Uh, it could be empirically measured. Okay. Um, effectively, what we're dealing with here is a not, it's, it's a fresh fruited wine. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't say that these taste like dried fruit or, you know, overly ripe fruit. Right. They taste fresh, but they're not tart. No. So therefore, medium acidity. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so um, common characteristics and things that we can look for in here. Strawberry, blackberry, black cherry, raspberry. And these different aspects are what you can get out of Grenache, Garnacha, grape, right? Mm -hmm. And it depends on where they're grown, how cool it is, how warm okay. it is, that kind of thing. This is a little warmer area, um, warm but dry. So you're getting a little more dark fruit yeah, on this. I'm not getting strawberry at all. Right. And yeah, I agree with okay. you. It's, yeah. Um, if you get something from France mm -hmm. in the Rhone, you're more likely to get a bit more of strawberry out of it. Cooler? Right? Uh, because yeah, cooler and, okay. and uh, a little difference in the soil. Okay. But in this guy, it's getting good and ripe. Um, 
but not overly ripe, but very ripe. I mean, this is a really dark, um, the color is oh, yeah. indicative too. Like you can't see through this. Mm -mm. This is a big garnacha, all right? And a lot of Grenache, you can see through. So it's a flexible grape with what you can food pair it with, but it's also sure. very flexible in that it is very expressive of where it's grown. So it expresses ah. its terroir. The combination of soil and climate really does make a difference with this, which is also similar to Pinot Noir. The little finickier grapes, mm -hmm. you can get this expression of what yeah. you want to bring out, but you've got to put in the extra work. Does a Pinot ever look like this though? I have had Pinot that looked like really? this. It can. Okay, wow. That would not be a common. Okay, a, yeah, because I'm used to seeing version. through. <laughs> and then those that I've had like that mm, commonly have a little something else thrown in there. Oh, yeah, so. okay. It's a blend with something else. Right. Okay. Even if it's below threshold, so they're still able to call it Pinot. Okay. They, you know, if it's going to look like this, it's probably got some right. petite straw. But this one's 100% Grenache. This is all or Garnacha. Yep. Garnacha. <laughs> Actually, interestingly, this one area in Spain, as I was doing my research in there, kind of flips back and forth. Oh, really? Between they calling call it Garnacha and Grenache. It's right on the other Close side of the mountains France. from France, mm -hmm. so which okay. we'll go into. So let's go ahead. Um, uh, this guy is a medium amount of oak aging, so it's not a vanilla bomb. It's more the oak is providing spice mm -hmm. and weight and kind of taming those tannins. The tannins I'm finding are waking up and inflating as it's had a minute in the glass, mm -hmm. right? Um, which is a wonderful, uh, kind of a wonderful anchor because there is a lot of fruit on here, but you've got chocolate and spice there's a lot going on. Yeah. I've been talking a lot, evidently. So before we jump over to the slides and get kind of into mm -hmm. um, into the origins of this wine, let's get some initial first uh, initial thoughts from you guys. What are you guys thinking? You enjoying it? What do you think? I like this a lot. I um, We opened it um, maybe around 7.20. Seven, about seven, but almost an hour ago. Like, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And um i think that was a really good decision overall because i think it sort of grab you know graduated us into those sort of baker spices and chocolates and stuff like that mm -hmm. um we both agree there's like a lot of like mocha mm -hmm. um i likened it a little bit to a mold wine where you get like a little bit of that like oh there's like um it's so, as though somebody dropped a little bit of a cinnamon stick or um star anise or or um orange zest or something else like you get a little bit of that um fruit but mostly a lot of again that like kind of cinnamon that mocha stuff like that um a lot of leather on the nose but not on the taste um because i was uh uh elizabeth you mentioned a, a pinot and i was thinking like it kind of reminds my first couple sips i was like it kind of reminds me a little bit of one but it very quickly evolved beyond that sure um but not nearly as like fruity as i would think of most grenaches um but very dark and complex i like it a lot good good other thoughts I know that Linda's thinking about this wine. <laughs> it's like, not all that is, okay. No, I was telling Paul, I said, I love it. Yeah. Um, but initially I felt like, and I don't know because you haven't mentioned it, but I, I kind of get like this clovey quality, maybe mm -hmm. more, definitely more so than like fruit. But if I had to dig for fruit, oh. I was telling Paul, it tastes like like um plum skin you know so like right. and i say that because my kids don't well my youngest doesn't like the skin so like i'll peel it for her but i love it so i'll eat the skin and i'm like this is what this reminds me of so yeah kind like, of like yeah. a clove mm -hmm. and but that's more forward than anything that's fruit but i i really enjoy it i think it's Nice. I, I thought you would. Yeah, I could get um, the plum skin too. Yeah, yeah. definitely. So, yeah. And then in wine terms, they will call that fruit leather. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. So just throwing right. it out there for everyone. It's like, there's your little bonus term of the night is fruit leather. It's the skin. Yes. There you go. Okay. You know that for wine IQ. That's right. It's going to be a wine IQ question. <laughs> <laughs> but no. Yeah. 
we we opened ours around the same same time you guys did, Chris and Robin, and um, but my first sip of this was probably about seven thirty or so, and wow. the back end was fruit leather, like but plum, plum skin is exactly what I was thinking, Linda. Which is funny because I have been processing fruit all day long to make jam. So, and oh, one, right. several of the things I've been doing, I did cherry plums today and I did plum cuts. And the cherry plums, oh my gosh, I can't wait to make this jam. But anyways, <laughs> this That's flavor great. is so much like plum to me, but now it's opened up and I get the clove and the, and the spices. Nice. Well, I really like that observation that, you know, Chris mentioned earlier and then we've, seen, we've heard repeated, which is that mold spices, you know, kind of thing where you have anise and cinnamon, that really fun spiciness is part of this grape. And you'll get a version of that spiciness almost no matter where it's grown. Mm -hmm. You will get some areas, like I said, where you can see right through it. And in those areas, it's all about plum and strawberry. Okay. Whereas we're getting a lot more, you know, some dark fruits to bring that to a, like a, a really ripe, deep plum, oh, yeah. you know, kind of thing along with black cherry. Mm -hmm. um, and that has to do with how ripe it gets in this very warm area. Uh, versus the cooler growth. Mm -hmm. okay. All right. So well, Brenda, Brenda made the growth. observation that it tastes like a chocolate covered cherry. It's got I like it. Oh, sure. Yeah. It. So that's yeah, I like it. it. Yeah. Yeah. With that yeah. that mocha cherry thing in there is, mm -hmm. uh, and it is not always you. you um, which is that's what I kind of wanted to get out of a higher end garnacha, is you get that chocolate quality with it, which is not always part of what you will get with a grenache. Oh. Okay. So. Um, and, and it's part of the fun of you can taste different areas of the world and, and, and it is a not just a versatile grape but it expresses very differently so yeah, I, was gonna, I was gonna mention the uh, somebody talked about uh, chinos if you get to uh, washington state at the, at the higher level oh you got a serene domain our domain serene there and i think and you can mm -hmm. dark black chinos but they're not quite the same flavor as we're having tonight and the, the Grenache, I mean, you can tell it a mile away, even though it's like the last I blend mix, you can tell it's in there. Right. <laughs> Interesting. Very good choice, Jeff. Oh, thank you so much. I, I was excited to bring this one. I looked at it and I thought, oh, that one, because I realized with all the wines we've tasted and we've been through Spain several times and we'll be back, um, that we've never had a, from anywhere 100% Grenache. Mm -hmm. We've had the blends from the Southern Rome, right. um, but it was time to, I think, to, to let it shine. And Absolutely. It's, this, is, this is a great wine. Oh, right? yeah, it's fantastic. I, I, I really, really enjoyed this guy. So, all right, let's go uh, learn about where it comes from and who's making this wine. Okay. Credit where credit's due, there right? Oh, wait, before we do that, because oh. we have the, the picture of the bottle on here. Mm -hmm. So obviously you and I both agreed that these are tiles tiles right yeah is there a story behind it at all or it's just they liked it so there were these guys over at alto moncayo mm -hmm. making wine and you're they, just gonna make something out i am i'm totally making yeah. up the story right now and they decided on making a really <laughs> cool they label. decided this label yes. was cool okay. that's that's the total story i had <laughs> you see when the bs meter started yeah, going off i she, knew she can hear it on the way just in gonna make so I, something up yes uh, okay see uh, in my youth i would have believed whatever you said but right. yes okay here we go okay so garnacha granache the exact same grape um and here are the characters strawberry at times we're more in the black cherry raspberry um, and plum, which is kind of fun that it's not it's not listed in the traditional, but mm -hmm. we can all I think we can all agree it's there. Absolutely. Anise, tobacco, citrus rind. So that goes back to that kind of a, you know, that um, you throw a little citrus when you do mold wine and things okay. in there. It's almost like a heated sangria kind of thing. Yeah, I don't feel like I'm getting tobacco at all. Um, and not necessarily in this case. I agree okay. with you on that. Um, not not much. It's because that tobacco in this case is expressing as cocoa. Okay. It, That's it would where be we're getting that chocolate. Right. It would be a continuum. So if that were to be lighter and leaner, you'd probably elevate up to like a tobacco quality. Okay. So um, oak is usually medium. And then here's the medium tannins, medium acidity. Um, and a medium plus on the alcohols. It's not unusual to be a big boy with the uh, or uh, with uh, Grenache. And, and, Grenache. Plus. and we're right. at the high end of this range. Here. Right. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah, Spain is going to be very much responsible for that 16 side 
oh, okay. and France is going to be down at 13. That's because crazy. Spain likes higher ABV or just because they tend to, the, the way they deal with the grape? More warmth. Okay. Yep. More warmth. Just more warmth. Yeah, warmer okay. growth. All right. So, and then you can see the color over there, which we're a little darker than that one tonight. But once again, this is a little more, this is one of the more intense expressions of Garnacha. Okay. Mm. Yeah. So, I mean, I mean yeah. you, you can see a color that, similarity on there, but it, we're a little more intense. It's right. Because okay. that looks more like Pinot to me. Okay. We've got a chat. So hold on. Let's see. Sweet. What, I love messages. Yeah. It went away. Let me try it again. It's not showing in the share. Let me stop sharing just a moment because for whatever reason, normally it, bring, it will bring it up and share, but no. Mm. Okay, so either Chris or Robin, I don't think it's oaky, but I think you can taste it in the same way you can taste, you can in a bourbon. Mm. I don't have enough of a bourbon memory to get that, so right. I'll just- No, no, it. I agree. No, it's, and that would be medium oak. You can tell it's present. Mm -hmm. You can tell it's present, but it's not dominating. Mm. So, mm -hmm. for example, none of us were describing this as a vanilla flavor, right? So vanilla would come if it was heavily oaked. If it was a young, aggressive oak, we'd be talking about vanilla in this wine. Okay. And we're not, we're talking about spice. Spice is a combo. The best way of using oak is if you have a wine, a grape in this case, that will lend itself to spiciness. And then the oak elevates that spiciness up rather than covering it or replacing it and that kind of thing. Okay, yeah. That's that's the thing I don't like in Chardonnays, right? When it has like a young oak and it just becomes a vanilla bomb. Yes. Okay. See, but you don't mind it so much in red. Okay. All right. See, he, he knows my palate better than I do. So mm -hmm. <laughs> I just know if I like something or not, but there you go. Would you like to go to the next one? Please. Okay. All right. So here we are. So in this case, what we have, and this is kind of what I discussed with Pino. Um, Pino has a thin skin in a nice balance throughout where you have the acidity toward the center and then flavorfulness in the outer uh, peripheral zone, right? In this case, it's, this is kind of a very, very balanced grape. We have a medium skin, we have a medium peripheral zone and we have a medium level intermediate zone with all the acidity. So it kind of runs uh, you know, back and forth uh, on that. It's a balanced grape. Every time I hear like all those mediums, I just think about like, if you had to describe somebody, what was the suspect like average height, average weight, average, right. you know, like right. that you, <laughs> medium, right. medium, medium. But well, I feel like it's so much more than right. that. And I, you know, I was about to go there because the way I'm describing it, it's like medium. It almost sounds like average, right, average, right. average. That's what I keep but thinking. here's what we're talking about is you have a grape that has the ability to go one way or the other, really interesting or really not. And I've okay. had some. And it comes down to, therefore, it's a really great palette for the winemaker to express themselves. Oh. And that's more of what you should take away mm -hmm. from Pinot Noir and Garnacha Grenache. Right. Is it's, it can go either way. If you abuse it and you just grow it fast in order to make a bunch of wine, it will not be very interesting. You, it would be one of those you're like, well, you know what? Tastes like red. Okay. And you move on. Yeah, it's you know? very like yeah. one dimensional. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. When you when you say medium, I, I hear when you're talking about wine, well balanced. With that medium, medium. When you say medium, it sounds it, it by interpreted as balanced. Well, it's not I appreciate cool. that, Paul. That's why you get to come back. <laughs> Earn another week. All right. That's right. <laughs> Paul's earned himself one more. All right. <laughs> okay. Next slide. Yes, please. Okay. Okay, so let's look at where we are. So um, good old España right here. And we're in the northeast of Spain up here. Um, so right in the middle of the growing latitude of wine. So it does not shock me that it would be available there, right? Mm -hmm. Let's zoom on in. All right, so here's within Spain. We are in this little area right here, Campo oh, wow. de Borja, right? close to the border of France. Mm -hmm. Here's the Pyrenees, the Pyrenees um, mountains and they're basically the foothills along with a wonderful river. Uh, let's see here. Actually, yeah, I guess I'll just uh, jump over. So is it because of the elevation that all of these people like down south, there's only one real region that's showing that grows? 
Oh, Mars down in the southern Spain. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it is lower elevation, mm -hmm. um, and it is much hotter, and okay. it, it doesn't get you know it, it all. I. It's really not that humid there still. Um, okay. Most of what's going on in southern Spain, though, is which we can talk about a little bit of is a different grape. That this area is where they make brandy. Ah, okay. Yeah. So there's a lot of wine growing going on down here, a wine grape growing, mm -hmm. but they turn it into brandy. Okay. They don't drink it. It's the, um, it is the air, the Aaron grape, A-I-R-E-N, the Aaron grape. So um, it's just kind of a different thing. In that head is there? And that area is where they're making sherry. Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. With wonderful grapes like Pedro Jimenez. I love that it has a name. Right? I know. It's <laughs> like, like a name name. It's, I it's, it has a name name. It has a name. first and Pedro last Jimenez. name. It's, it's, people call it PX. Um, <laughs> that's yeah, fantastic. It's like, it's like, that's Steve Johnson. Right. Yeah, that Steve Johnson grape's really good. You know, I, I don't know. Maybe that'll be the new Missouri grape. You showed me. She, Elizabeth I, yeah. sent me an article. And if you guys remember, I know this is an aside and it's on the video, but I'll go with it real quick. Um, the first American viticultural area, which is the area designated area of a certain uh, quality of grape growing, right, was in Missouri. It was not, Napa was number two. The first one was in Missouri. And that group in Missouri evidently is beginning to tear up because they've been growing sweet white wines this whole time. They're beginning to tear up those, those old vines and try to get in something that's a little more serious. So Missouri has decided to give it a go at making some higher quality wines. I just find it interesting that they're deciding to do that now as things are just getting hotter and hotter, you know? Mm. But yeah, I, I mean, I hope they, they can achieve something because it's right. a lot closer than Napa is for us to go. Oh, yeah, right. Just travel to, right? That'd be fun. Mm -hmm. All right, so, um, so here we are. So here's Spain. All right, and we're up in the you know the northeastern area is the Aragon, which is this. This is where we are tonight. The, the subregion is Aragon, and this is Campo de Borja right here, within it. So right along the river, getting up into the foothills of the Pyrenees here. Just a little closer look. The uh, let me see here. The designation for Campo de Borja was awarded to them in 1977 as an official DO, designation of origin. Uh, the vines in the area tend to be 30 to 50 years old. So um, old, old vines, and we'll see more of them. Not ancient, but old. And uh, <laughs> that's how I'm going to describe you in November. I'm gonna, not ancient, but old. But old. There you go. That's not turn 50. In the <laughs> it's not a big area. Like you can see here and you're like, all right, well, that doesn't look very big. It's not. It's 15 acres. Oh, Wow. Yeah. I mean, I looked at that. And I, I thought it was bigger than 15 acres. I ran the so. calculations twice and it came up the same both times. I just not sure I trust the source on that. Okay. Let's just go with it's really small. And I do trust that there are only 15 wineries within the area. Okay. All right. Uh, the oldest vineyard started in the year 1145. Wow. Yeah. Now, not continuously running, but continuously growing grapes in the same area. And that kind of a thing. Not there's not a venue. There's not a winemaker that has like seven generations there. They've, oh. they've come and gone since then. Okay, but different winemakers. Somebody was always growing. There. Right. It started okay. with the Romans and that kind of a thing. So. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So we're jumping in a little more, and here it is. This little area here, Campo de Borja. And uh, and by the way, this area, this you know, very much you can see the T and the X. Mm -hmm. That's a dead giveaway. You're talking about the Basque area, which once you get into the mountains, you have a lot of Basque influence, sure. which you do here as well. So Campo de Borja. Um, let's take a look. There it is in the think fall. We've, yeah, I was going to say I don't think we've ever seen fall grapevines yeah. in any of these pictures. They've always been verdant, not you know mm -hmm. the yellows and oranges and rust colors. It's That's yeah. very cool to see them like that. Right. So Garnacha is the fourth most popular grape grown in Spain. Okay. Number one is the Aaron for the brandy. Okay. Number two, Tempranillo. So that's traditional Rioja, sure. right? Uh, number three is Boban. 
We haven't had that. No, we have not. I have one in the store. We can drink a bubble. They're very fruit forward. Okay. All right. Um, I mean, it doesn't make them bad. Fruit it's just, forward, they're but not really sweet. fruit driven. Okay. Not sweet, but very much fruit driven. Okay. Mm -hmm. And interesting, uh, Grenache actually used to be a lot more popular in the uh, since the eighties. It has moved. So worldwide production of Grenache, Grenache, right? There were eight hundred thousand acres planted through the uh, in, when measured in the late seventies, early eighties. There's now four hundred ninety-four thousand acres. Oh wow! In the world, it has really actually been falling out of favor. Um, they were planting them before, so this has been. And I talk about this bits and pieces as we go mm -hmm. through it, how the world changed in the 70s to making better wine right. most places. Right. Not always, but most places. And Garnacha Grenache is a high producer. Mm -hmm. Like you can make very, you know, not very good wine, but a lot of it cheaply okay. with this grape. But you can pay attention to it and obviously make something beautiful like right. we're enjoying tonight. Right. But that's why it most of what it was being used for were those people that were just doing mass production, cheap wine. Mm -hmm. Here's a red, it tastes red, it'll get you drunk, you know. Um, and, so, and I'm really glad that that tends to be changing. Right. But I'm not happy to see what is a very beautiful grape necessarily fall out of favor. Fall out of favor mm -hmm. and being replaced. I'm sure with Cabernet Sauvignon. The world loves Cabernet Sauvignon. The world does, not just Oh, yeah, it's the world. The US. Yeah. Okay. It is the world. So, back when there were a lot of really poor poorly made wines mm -hmm. out there as a country, if are we just looking at if you wanted a good wine back in the late 70s? Mm -hmm. You're going to France or Italy? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Pretty much. That's what you. I mean, obviously, do. there are going to be little winemakers in places, and mm. and some that maybe we're not exporting to the states at that right. point too. But right. Yeah, exactly. But you're right. Generally. Generally. If you're if you're, if you're in 1977, you're looking at France or Italy. Okay. Yeah. So yep. When I have my whole Back to the Future moment, I'll just grab France or Italy exactly. off the shelf, and that'll be it. Well, and there's so many different chateaus and things like uh, that still have that reputation because back then that was where you had to go in order to get great wine. Well, you sure. Know, you'd have to go to the Bordeaux. Yeah. So yeah. if you haven't shifted your thinking at all, you're still thinking, oh, if it's not from France or Italy, then it's crap. Right. Okay. Right. Yeah. So, uh, okay. So we're in uh, Campo de Borja. Let's go ahead. And I think we're just going to enjoy some of the visuals here. Oh, yeah. Right. Um, looks like a gorgeous place. Hilly, because mm -hmm. you can see we're in the foothills here, moving toward the mountains. Um, the um, the well, well, we'll see a much better version of the uh, soil in a little bit. You want me to go to the next one? Yes. Please. Okay. I was so, just enjoying that one so much. There are the Pyrenees wow. in the background. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you can see the, the grapevine. This is moving toward fall again here. Mm -hmm. That's got to be after harvest. But you can see it's. Um, it's a, a lot of, it's a very rocky soil going into clay, which we hear that story a lot, right? Yep. Next. Mm -hmm. So. Um, yeah, you can see it there. So here we are. Sure. This is, so um, this is the, I can't see this, my whole thing I thought, the okay. Bodega Salto Moncayo. So mm -hmm. Moncayo is the name of the mountain peak that we're looking at, which is what they're named after. All right, so. It, um, the winery was, is in the town of, or just outside the town of Zargoza. Um, let's go ahead. Um, so they the, red clay there. They, um, they do, it's kind of a red clay, stony soil, limestone, dolomite, quartz, and slate rocks over red clay. Uh, approximately 1500 feet to 1800 feet above sea level. So getting up there a little bit cool dry climate and what's kind of cool is it is sandwiched let me see if i did it <laughs> on, we'll get there in a minute <laughs> let me get back up here it's sandwiched between so it has a double maritime influence so it's sandwiched between the atlantic and the mediterranean mm -hmm. so it's kind of cool so in the in the summer it's cooled by the atlantic breezes coming down and in the winter 
it's warmed from the Mediterranean influence. Huh. And they come back in both ways. That's really in addition, cool. you have higher altitude, you're in the foothills moving toward the mountains. Mm -hmm. So that gives you intensity of sunlight. And because of these two things, there's very little rainfall. So you've got dryness and great control of your water sources. So you're not going to dilute the juice if you leave it on the vine a long right. time. And you're right on the river, so you can irrigate just as you want at a reasonable price. Plus, you're in the middle of the latitudes in the wine growing. It region. all yeah. comes together in this place, yeah, which is why. Perfect growing area. And that's one of the reasons things that um, the winemakers, and we may hear it again um, in a minute, the Bodegas Alta Moncayo winemakers wanted to work with Grenache because with time, it pulls such great character out of the soil and they can afford to leave it on the grape uh, excuse on me the on the vine. vine much longer for slow long ripening to pull that character mm. because they can count on the fact that it will not rot and it will not become oversaturated with water because of that so they um i wanted so anyway i wanted to jump back and show that real quick uh, they also have the help of el cierzo which is the wind, all right? So because <laughs> of the mountains with the two oceans, uh -huh. they have a, uh, a wind that comes in from the Northwest, which is very similar to the Mistral in, that's famous in oh, Rome. right, right. So you have this continuous windy situation, mm -hmm. which is drying the soil and keeping mold off of the vines. So this all comes together mm -hmm. to allow them to have no mold but lots of sunlight to grow very ripe grapes, but with character and not overly ripe. That wind thickens the skins as It'll well? It'll thicken the skins right? and okay. can, that's right. You, yeah. you remember from before, it's awesome. I, sometimes I pay attention to what you say during these days. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so um, anyway, as that allows it to get in and get all that character. Mm -hmm. It's gonna thicken the skin some, which thicker skins. What are we seeing in this case? Darker, darker. color than most mm -hmm. of the time. Yeah and darker fruit flavors mm -hmm. because you thickened the skin and gave it more intensity. Right. Rather than the thinner skinned Grenache, we've got a thicker skinned Garnacha. Even though you said it is a fairly thin skinned grape. It is, it's a medium, yeah. well, it's, it's an average it's a medium. Skin. It's a medium skinned grape. Everything, you know what? You, you, can't, you can't hate on medium anymore because in there the right hands. Hmm. Let's go ahead on. All right. All right, so we are going to have our first videos. Okay, so hold on, if I have to share our sound. So so that you know, you go okay. to more and go to share sound okay. so that they can see it. Okay, all right, so all right. video. It's not playing for, I mean, it's playing, but I can't I don't know that sound. this one necessarily has sound. Oh, okay. So the other one does. So this is just going into where it is. I thought it was fun. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can see that I like seeing the different elevations that you can mm -hmm. tell a little bit better. And there it is. That's really cool. So there's another one. Yep. Uh, next screen. All right. So the next screen. No, you don't need that. No, yeah, hold on. That's the same one. There we go. Okay. So here's the one of the owners and the winemaker um, talking about this making this exact one. Okay. So hopefully we can hear this. Right. So, um, and I'm just going to pull up the chat real quick. So if you can't hear it, let us know. Let's see. Oh, good. It should be working for everybody. It should be working for you. If you don't have sound, check your sound. My name is Miguel. I am the assistant winemaker in the winery. And today I will talk about our three wines. Raton is 100% Garnacha all vines. The vines to produce this type of wine have around 35 up to 45 years old. 
aging in new French and American oak during 16 months. The appearance is deep red and the scarlet green, the iron, sweet flavors of fruit, black fruit and violet in the nose, and the palate is good freshness and soft tannic and good final. Right. You didn't see that at the end? No. You should have cut that. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> don't go and buy this at Total Wine. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I don't think this one even has it. But anyway. Oops. There we so go. I thought it was kind of fun. Um, oh. oh. Yes. Yep. It just wants to keep playing. It does. Okay. All right. So, and they do actually have three levels. So, like as an interesting thing for this, they do not have an entry level in the Moncayo line, right, right? right. That, that there is no, because you can get really good Spanish wine for 10 bucks, right? Mm -hmm. The Moncayo line does not have that one, right? But- um, They sell three levels, they just don't start at entry. Right, they they actually have a sister company where mm -hmm. we have those and they're really good too. Okay. So, so um, just not grown in the same area, not vintage in the same way. Um, but what's in, so this guy, like we're, we're talking about 90 plus points every time. The next level is about $50 a bottle-ish. Mm -hmm. um, and that one hits 94 to 96. Oh, wow. And then okay. they have their top end one is well over $100 a bottle, but just got a perfect score this time. A perfect score? Yep, 100 points. Oh. So they know what they are doing. Yeah, they do. Right? Wow. Um, Which one was that one, Jeff? That one is, um, I can't remember the name of it off the top of my head. It was it was there for a minute, uh, but I can tell you about it later on. It's uh, it's tempting to bring that one in, I'll tell you that much. <laughs> yeah, I'd love to try a perfect right. score one. That'd be cool. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah, I mean, it's not, you're not going to buy it on your average Tuesday, but you, I mean, right. it's not, it's not. Seven hundred dollars. Right, you know, it's, it's not like the thousand dollar bottle of wine. Right. We'll, we'll talk mean, about. Linda, mm -hmm. Linda's got some gift cards, so. <laughs> there, there you go. <laughs> no, cut those up. We, we don't like gift cards. <laughs> we, the, all those points are good for something, right? I mean, yeah. you know, I'm just gonna uh, cash them all in, get with a hundred point wine. It's fine. There you go. Actually, mm -hmm. after we're gonna, we ha do have an in store tasting coming up, so after the video, we'll we'll talk about that. That's true. Yeah. There you go. All right, uh, let's jump back and uh, okay. to the slides, please. Is it forward? Yeah. There we nope. Go. Oh. That's it's we're pulling it back. So, nope. There we go. There we go. All right. So let's talk about our wine score explanations as we always get to. So this guy is 90 plus points. We're talking about 91 was about the lowest I saw. So 91 to 93 points. Um, on this guy, um, not that 85 points is anything bad. An 88 point wine would be a very good wine. Um, and I I love pointing that out because mm -hmm. if you see an 88 pointer, nobody should just skip that. It's that that could be an excellent wine. Plus, so oh, they're already they're already giving their great, well, in the chat. <laughs> <it's> like, <laughs> all the people that already know where I'm going on this. So given that we're talking about 85 to 89 is a very good wine. 80 to 84 is a good, solid wine, well made. But 90 to 94 is an outstanding wine. Uh, tends to be a combination, once again, of how much did you enjoy it? Does it have characteristics that make it seem special to you and stand out in your mind? And how does it, and a little bit of it also would be, how does it fare against other Garnachas, which obviously... It's one of those things that comes with time. When you look at when you look at the big professional guys, this is everything they're looking at. Yeah. I don't care what you guys bring to the table. Bring your, you know, bring what you right. want. It's casual, but tell me what you're thinking, given those thoughts. Well, and the bottom line is too, if it's a wine you like, it's a wine you like. Just you know, oh, yeah, buy what you like. Don't don't do it according to score and just think, oh, this is what I, I'm supposed to right. like. I was wine tasting today and there's a wine that was I thought was fantastic, mm -hmm. right? I, I really loved what it was right. and I loved what it was for that area. It was 88 points. Mm -hmm. I'm totally bringing it in. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a very good wine. Yeah. There you go. So let's see. Uh 
Right. Chris, easy 92, maybe 94. Nice. Uh, Linda, Brenda, and Laura, 92, 93, 94. I'm guessing John isn't there this week. We can't always tell because normally he's- John's off, traveling. He, he, oh, okay. Because he's off camera very often That's too. That's true. The women just push him to the side. Well, I don't okay. you know. Like <laughs> Robin, 93. Um, Jerry, 92, 93. 93 from both of them, Linda and Paul. And then Rachel and David, 92 to wow, 94. These, these yeah, are, these are, are great ratings. Those are great. I'm, I'm glad you guys are really enjoying yeah, this wine. I would have done 93, 94. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, I'm right there. I'm right there. It's, it's, mm -hmm. I, I knew it was a great wine, mm -hmm. you know, but it really is an exceptionally good wine. It, it is an excellent, excellent Garnacha. And it's one of those that has enough tannin and character. Mm -hmm. You don't need to be a Garnacha drinker to appreciate this wine. If you like right. a good, kind of powerhouse red right you're in you're you're there and mm -hmm. yet you get to enjoy the differences you know yeah i think i'm i'm actually going to need to stop sharing my score because like there have been twice that we've had wines that everybody else is like I, especially one week i love it and i was like oh if i never drink that again i'm fine it happens so <laughs> no it happens i mean well we had um I think it was uh, Dave a couple, two, three weeks ago. Oh, yeah, Dave had an 88 like, when other people called it 94. I mean, it happens. That, no, well, that's it happens true. that Dave is wrong a lot. That's what that means. <laughs> um, well, and then I think John and Liliana, they have their, their mic turned on. So did you guys oh. want to share something? Uh, do you want to share something? Um, Liliana, do you want to share something? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, thank, thanks for, uh, I want to thank Linda and Paul for inviting us tonight. Thank you very much. Uh, um, you know, we, we typically drink cabs, you know, um, and I, we've had uh, Spanish wines. Whoops. We, okay. Um, the, I, I like this Grenache or Grenache, yeah. you know, more than others I've had. Typically, when we've had Spanish wines, it's the Tempraneo, you mm -hmm. know, grape, um, which I enjoy more, I've enjoyed more than Grenache. Mm -hmm. But this one, and particularly when it opened up, and we opened up about seven o'clock. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Let mm -hmm. it breathe for a while. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The more it opened up, the more it, this one is definitely, as you discussed earlier, um, more complex. Mm -hmm. than a lot of, and that's, that's, it was so it was surprisingly much more enjoyable than others I've had before. I guess I haven't had very complex. Before. Well, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a good point, and John, and it, and it does. Said, yeah. Yeah, I mean, there, I have I have ten not ten dollar granaches in the store. I do, and they serve a purpose, and they're very enjoyable. Mm -hmm. But they don't provide this experience. They don't have the character, right? Yeah. And that's what I like to do. With, of course, with these wines, is to yeah. do something where you say, "Okay, here's something that I so really this enjoy." I can definitely tell the difference. Uh, great, excellent. Yeah, I'm glad you like that's it. Great that makes it. me happy. Mm -hmm. Arch, yeah. Yeah. And then Chris and Robin said they definitely had lower rating for, for some tastings, but mm. doesn't always jive with everyone. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. 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 It's no, just, right. you guys can say it. I can't say it. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> yeah. You guys can say what you want. <laughs> I got to get the I got to plug in. Elizabeth will look at me and be like, what did you put? I'll just like slide my glass to the side and be like, no, thank you on the refills. <laughs> But part of that is there are certain grapes that you just don't like as much, but yeah. I mean, that's true. Yeah, yeah. which is fine. I mean, Absolutely. that's the case for everybody. Yep. All right, let's uh, jump back. We'll finish up the presentation. Yep. And then we can go to the uh, well, open I, yeah, discussion. Well, I, I just want to go to like, there are certain grapes that I just don't like. J j like there are certain beers that I just don't like, mm -hmm. like in the store. Like mm -hmm. if somebody wants to hand me a double IPA, I say no thank you to that every single time mm -hmm. yeah so yeah and that's fine I mean yeah but almost every sour porter sour I'm gonna say yes to mm -hmm. yeah I mean I can't think of one I would just off the hat like to say no to mm -hmm. I would say yes right well I'm glad everyone liked this one that's great I I, I thought it was an exceptionally good wine too yeah it makes no, me happy I, I really and I like the mm -hmm. bottle even though there's no story behind the label at all of it it's pretty <laughs> All right. Next. Yes. Ready? Yeah. Oh, wait, hold on. One chat. We'll delay it just a bit more. 100 percent agree with you oh, on the beer. Yeah, I saw yeah, I saw you. I saw Linda's look, the look <laughs> on her face when you talked about rejecting a double IPA. 
<laughs> by the way, we have some delicious ones in the you store. No, I, I know. I mean, a lot of people love them, just mm -hmm. not me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, see, there you go. Paul right. loves it. Yeah. Did, right. I, I, Rachel and David have their hand up, I think. Oh, I do see their hand. Oh, you know, I'm used to seeing a yellow hand, not the, the oh, yeah. skin tone one. The skin tone so. one blends with your wall. <laughs> Sorry, Mike. This has gotten much more astringent to me. It's gotten, and I don't know whether it's the tenons or, but it's it's progressed much more into that realm than it did initially. Hmm. It was very fruit forward initially, but it's it's now, I don't know whether it's as it warms or not, but it's it's gotten more acidity. I, I, I would think more acid, but yeah, yeah, no, it's um, well, the the tannins are definitely plumped up. The um, the chocolate is really jumped up. Um, the so I would go with much more. So, but you know, in the beginning, there was definitely more spice than chocolate. Now I'm going to give it a little more chocolate than spice mm -hmm. at this point. Um, and I think it just still finishes with a really nice dry fruitiness, though. But the, the change is just as it's opening, so mm -hmm. oxygenating. Like, yeah, it's yeah. just opening up and relaxing. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. okay. and then let's see. Uh, but those tannins are becoming a little more aggressive and that kind of thing as they've inflated. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Ready? Mm -hmm. cool. All right. So thank you to Wine Folly, Wine Spectator, Wikipedia, and Bodegas. <laughs> Bodegas Alto Moncayo um, for Dot all com. of the information. Yeah. So that was super helpful. And you guys are awesome. And ladies and gentlemen, one of my favorite places is Wine Folly. They're fantastic. Yep. Buy their books, go to their website. If you have any interest, or you can just, I'll give you the cliff notes. You know, whichever way you want to go, Wine Folly is awesome, though. All right. And so next week's wine. So we, I had so much fun with uh, you know, Garnacha, we couldn't be done with it. Uh, we're going back to the Southern Rome. So we're going to Domaine de Marcou, Le Roc, La Laurentine. So we, um, almost a year ago, went to the Southern Rhone. Mm -hmm. Southern Rhone is famous for GSMs, Grenache, Syrah, Mavedra blends. And they jump into different proportions of each. So even though you see a Grenache, Syrah, Mavedra, they're not always in that order. But within that, so what we drank about a year ago was a really delicious, but Iguigal's, Iguigal's Cote de Rhone Rouge. Oh, right? I remember that. Remember that? Mm -hmm. That's the one that I love having with, um, with uh, filet mignon. But that was a general. So that was a cuvee of lots of different regions within... The, within the Southern Rhone. The Southern Rhone has sub AVAs. The sub, well, they don't call them AVAs. As Americans, we would call it, you know, American viticultural areas. So, but they have sub viticultural areas that have their own character. The most famous is Chateauneuf de Pop, right? Um, right along there is Gigondas, which I love. Um, but those guys are really pricey, right? And so we try to keep it fairly reasonable on mm -hmm. these guys. The bargain of the century within there as a subgroup is Laroc. Laroc. So we're going to go work into a sub location, you know, a smaller location mm -hmm. that has its own character. It's literally across the river. You could throw a rock from Chateauneuf de Pop. Oh, wow. But instead of $65 a bottle, you're at like $28 a bottle. And it's, it's fantastic. In fact, most of the wine made from the grapes of Laroc are made over in Chateauneuf de Pop. The winemakers, oh, it's the same yeah. winemaker. It's the same, yeah. Um, so it's, it's, an, it's a wonderful, A, a delicious wine, but B, a great way to kind of get a bargain out of France, mm. which can be difficult. Sure. Mm -hmm. So I had one Laroc that we sold for 10 years and we've been open for 11. Mm -hmm. So most of the time, right? But they left the state of Florida. They stopped wow. sending it. I don't know if they left the country, but they're not here mm -hmm. anymore. Uh, so I went on a search for a new Laroc. Um, there's not a ton of them available, only three or four in the state of Florida that I could find. Tasted through several, was not happy. <laughs> this was the last one. And I was really, 
I was like, I thought, well, You're like maybe we won't just, I, I we guess, won't drink there. <laughs> right. No more Lorac, right? Um, no, this one is the best. Ah. It's better than the last one. It's okay. fantastic. Great. So, um, uh, so well, and evidently they agree with you with the ratings. Right. The ratings are fantastic on it. Um, it's got such a great combination. So, um, like I said, it's GSM, Grenache, like we had today, Syrah, and Mouvedra, which is, by the way, the same grape as Monastrell in Spain. So, oh. so uh, anyway, this guy is fantastic. Uh, we'll talk more about him and where he is and why. Uh, they work really well with all kinds of things. They're flexible again, but in a slightly different way. Uh, steak and peppers, stuffed mushrooms, barbecue pork chops. They can go, you could do something again with like a smoked fowl okay. kind of thing. Um, maybe even like a barbecue chicken, you know, to get a little bit of okay. a something that out. makes it bigger. Right. Mm. Mm -hmm. I was looking at one that was a Peruvian chicken, which I think would work, but it just seemed like so out there that I was like, eh, no one's going to I just that. don't know what that means. Like it it kind of <laughs> had like a lime and pepper, like habanero kind of thing. Okay, so. so something to spice it up. Yeah. So, okay. so anyway, that's what we're drinking next week. I hope you guys cool. will join us. Um, I've got a question, a hand up from ah, uh, Robin, Robin or Chris. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so one, Chris wanted to say that he ag agreed with David about something, but now- Oh, it was, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was at the uh, wine open the pot uh, um, over, over the course. Yes, but, but mm -hmm. my question is, so when, in, when we watched the video, um, the winemaker, and obviously you often mention um, American and French oak, do mm -hmm. no other countries make oak? <laughs> Good question. Oh. Yeah. Um, actually, uh, there's Hungarian oak as well. Uh, and that one is the, so uh, the American oak has the most open cell structure. So it's the most aggressively oaking, where it has the most aggressive effect on there. Uh, the French oak is in the middle, uh, much tighter than the American. And then Hungarian has the tightest structure. So it has the least effect on the wine. Then. Yeah, um, you, you can put a new one in there and it's going to have its own kind of, it adds more spice than mm -hmm. vanilla and that kind of a thing. And because the American oak is such an open cellular structure, you get not just vanilla, but if you have really a lot of young American oak, you mm -hmm. get vanilla and dill. Oh, huh. Mm -hmm. the, the, are those the only countries that like have cooperage? So they're the only ones that turn into barrels or it's the, I mean, because it can't be the only countries where oak grows. I mean. I'm not sure on the cooperage thing. Like I, I haven't done a ton of research right. beyond, okay. you know, beyond this is the cooperage used for this wine, right. that right. kind of thing. Um, Cause we, by the way, we had a wine with some Hungarian oak. In oh, it. did we? We did um, because of the Gurgic uh, Zinfandel. Oh. Because they have yeah, that in Croatia that and they were using, because mm -hmm. Hungary's right there. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So um, anyway, but yes, yeah, those are the three I know of. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure why other countries are not represented in there, but uh, that would be a whole study in and of itself. It's a true. Bit, but uh, yeah, it yeah. could just be that's so dominated by the others that mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. What's well, also interesting? I mean, you look at it. You could even ask, like, why is it only oak? Why is it not cedar? Why is it not this? Yeah. No, I'm glad you said that because that's actually what I what I said to Chris while we were drinking this. I was like, oh, like Spanish cedar or something like that. And when you think of like, for example, beer, like a white oak highlai or a cedar highlai or things like that. Um, and he was like, well, that's probably too soft of wood, but I don't, I know nothing about wood. To um, right. Cause a lot of times you see cedar chips added into something. And I've always assumed it's because it's soft, it absorbs a lot and it will impart too much flavor. Mm -hmm. Whereas oak is hardier and it will store it. But I think part of it has to do with what wood makes good barrels mm -hmm. with the right. traditional shape. Sure. Um, you can you can oak or you can wood things with chips. Oh, so you um, could do like a, a steel barrel and throw in chips. Yes, actually, there are some people that are beginning to do that with whiskey, and the whiskey world is losing its mind. Oh, but really? maybe we should talk about this. Okay. Other thing. No, no, let, let's pick it up. We'll stop the. We'll we'll have a toast to this beautiful wine. We'll go to the after party and talk about all these other things, which I'm happy to do because it's fun. So. In the meantime, thank you all for coming on this ride with us back into um, fixing an oversight in Spain. 
It was time. There you go. Um, but I think I think I made it up. Cheers, everyone. Right. Cheers. Cheers. Right. Thanks, everyone.